South Korea says it will consider sending weapons to Ukraine after North Korea signs a new pact with Russia. The government of the Republic of Korea respond to whatever actions that may uh, threaten our national security resolutely and decisively. Actor Donald Sutherland dies at the age of 88. Happy Hunger Games! And may the odds be ever in your favor. And the first academic research facility dedicated to the study of coffee opens in the United States. Given how important coffee is to our culture, to our economy, to our society, coffee needs academic study. Today is Friday, June 21st, and this is VOA's International Edition. I'm Scott Walterman. South Korea says it will consider sending weapons to Ukraine after Russia and North Korea signed a new defense pact. South Korean Foreign Minister Cho Tae-yul. Any direct or indirect uh, uh, assistance or cooperation that enhances North Korea's military capability is a clear violation of the multiple UN Security uh, Council resolutions. And it is indeed deplorable that a permanent member of the Security Council, which had agreed to the adoption of the, these resolutions, is now acting in, in violation of the resolutions. Russian President Vladimir Putin in Vietnam responded to the report that South Korea might send weapons to Ukraine. He's saying, as for the supply of lethal weapons to the war zone in Ukraine, that would be a very big mistake. So let's find out more. Joining us now to talk about the changing dynamic in Asia is Greg Brzezinski, who works on U.S. East Asian relations and East Asian international history at George Washington University. So let's start with the big picture here. Um, Russia's sort of trying to realign the dynamic in Asia, first in North Korea, in Vietnam, South Korea, then... Um, reacts to the pact with North Korea saying, well, maybe we'll send weapons to Ukraine. Um, is How unusual is all of this? I think that it's a somewhat unusual move for South Korea to start um, intervening in a you know in an international conflict by sending uh, by sending weapons, I don't think that's something that South Korea has done very often, if at all, uh, in the previous uh, decades. So I think that the fact that they're willing to even consider doing this now. Uh, really shows that the pact between Moscow and Pyongyang uh, was uh, perceived as being very threatening by the South Korean leadership. Now, Putin tried to make the point that they have nothing to worry about, saying it's only a mutual defense pact and that it would only be um, enacted if North, Cor North Korea gets attacked. Uh, right. And I've heard that justification coming from Putin. But I think South Korea is still concerned the fact that uh, even if North Korea hasn't invaded, it's always been threatening to and has continued to build up its weapons capacity. Uh, you can begin to understand why this is something that's worrisome to South Korea. I also think something that probably would worry the South Korean leadership is just the image of this, this image of a, a sort of a, um, a, a, a sort of, um, you know, replay of the Cold War, uh, e even even in, you know, grander ways. I don't think Stalin or Khrushchev uh, ever uh, got, I, I don't think uh, Stalin Stalin didn't even visit North Korea. I don't think any Russian leader uh, ever got quite the reception in North Korea that Putin's been given during the last few days. So just this very strong affirmation of friendship between Russia and North Korea 
uh, is also very troubling to the South Koreans, I think. Well, and and you have to assume that North Korea is going to get something for what it's giving Russia beyond, I mean, so you know they need food and they need fuel, which Russia has both. But yes. what they really want, I assume, is technology. Yes, and I think that's South Korea's concern that uh, that the so that, that Russia will uh, provide not only food and fuel, but also uh, that it will provide new technologies, that it will help North Korea to further develop its weapons programs, and that it will be difficult to monitor this new partnership between Moscow and Pyongyang and actually see uh, everything that they do. How how much do you think this disrupts Russia-China relations? Because Russia is helping Vietnam uh, take oil out of the China Sea, which China claims is their oil because they claim the South China Sea. Um, it's kind of a dysfunctional. You've got four countries here, right? Uh, China, right. Uh, North Korea, Vietnam, and Russia, and they don't always align. <laughs> That's absolutely true. I think it's it's a very interesting dynamic, and in how China is seeing Putin's recent Asia trip is a very interesting and probably a conflicted in a number of ways. On the one hand, uh, we've seen that Beijing's relationship with Moscow has actually improved in recent years, uh, in part because there's been rising tensions between Beijing and Washington. Uh, and at the same time, Beijing has also been doing some of the same things that Moscow is doing vis-a-vis -vis North Korea. It's also uh, slowly been improving its relationship with North Korea over the last few years. Vietnam is a little bit of a different story because there's territorial disputes between uh, Vietnam and China and because uh, the Vietnamese, uh, to a much greater degree than they perhaps view Russia as a threat, have uh, you know seen China as a threat. So I think... Um, I, I think there is sort of a, a very complicated overall dynamic there. One interesting thing that I think uh, I'll be looking out for is, um, you know, there's there's even, you know, even while there's some congruence in views between Russia, China and North Korea now when it comes to the United States, there's also traditionally been some jockeying for influence in North Korea between uh, China and Russia. So I think what will be interesting now that Moscow and, uh, and Pyongyang are moving so close together is does Beijing try to step in with a, its own additional offers of aid to North Korea to assure that, okay, uh, the relationship between North Korea and Russia is going to improve but they don't want uh, North Korea to become so close with Russia that China is sort of left out of that. Mm. Thanks so much for the time. Okay, thank you. Greg Brzezinski at George Washington University. Norwegian defense manufacturer Konsberg Gruppen has opened a new missile factory to meet surging demand for weapons from Western countries spooked by Russia's war in Ukraine and China's modernization of its armed forces. Norway Deputy Defense Minister Anne-Marie Anarud. We have experienced a situation with growing demand for defense material and especially for uh, missiles and ammunition over the past two and a half years after the outbreak of the full-scale war in Ukraine. We are in a situation where most Western countries have donated substantially from their own stocks and need to replenish. The plant will produce, per year, hundreds of missiles that are currently used by 14 countries, 11 of which are in NATO or the EU. 
The Biden administration on Thursday announced plans to bar the sale of antivirus software in the United States made by Russia's Kaspersky Lab, citing the firm's large U.S. customers, including critical infrastructure providers and state and local governments. We're following these other stories from around the world. The IMF said on Thursday its executive board approved $786.2 million for Tanzania to help tackle climate change. At least 34 people have died and dozens hospitalized after drinking illegally brewed liquor tainted with methanol in southern India. Slovakia's parliament approved the government's planned revamp and leadership change at public broadcaster RTVS on Thursday, overruling concerns that changes will bring the broadcaster under political control and harm media freedom. In our continuing coverage of the 2024 U.S. presidential election, voters are vulnerable to bad actors using artificial intelligence to create disinformation that benefits rival politicians or promotes the interests of foreign governments. VOA's Ivana Pidborska looks at the use of AI in election 2024 in this report, narrated by Carolyn Prasuti. Artificial intelligence has already made an appearance in this election, as in this computer-generated photo of Donald Trump hugging infectious disease expert Dr. Anthony Fauci. And this fake robocall of Joe Biden telling New Hampshire voters to skip their primary. We'll need your help in electing Democrats up and down the ticket. The timing of electoral deepfakes is what makes them so dangerous, says media expert Elaine Kmark of the Brookings Institution. Even 24 hours before the election, someone puts out a deepfake or a piece of disinformation. It's really difficult. It's really difficult to fight back. And that could, in a close election, it could make the difference um, between winning and losing. Rajul Gupta's firm Deep Media helps the Pentagon detect deep fakes, which he says are popular because they are inexpensive and easy to produce. End to end, it takes about 15 minutes to create a deep fake. There are many free services online. If you want to pay for some of the better ones, a 30 second audio clip is maybe two cents. Attorney and free speech advocate Ari Cohen. There's been a lot of talk about Russia, but China also, especially as they are fighting in the AI arms race to try and jump ahead. Cohen says the most sophisticated overseas operations aim to place a piece of political disinformation with influential Americans for them to pass on to others. The biggest U.S. tech firms and social media platforms have promised some voluntary self-regulation of AI in political campaigns, but no federal laws currently govern the practice. Attorney and free speech advocate Ari Cohen. It's very, very difficult to regulate political speech in the United States. The First Amendment protects that core political speech very strongly and for good reason. We don't want the government putting the hands on the scale of its finger on the scale of elections. Gupta says much of that difficulty lies in distinguishing between something that is false and something that is a characterization of an issue with which one might not agree. So how are we to know when something is a political deep fake? And the audio quality is bad? That is a hint that it could be AI generated. It might sound kind of silly or trivial, but actually just looking for those watermarks and being able to find those watermarks quickly in images, audio, and video can again, filter out a lot. So if you're on a video call with someone and you think they're a deep fake, ask them to spin around in their chair. And uh, if they don't, they might be a deep fake. Cohen says AI can be used for good in politics. It can allow candidates to reach diaspora communities in their own languages. And it can give campaigns better insight into voter behavior so they can better tailor their messaging. For Ivana Bidborska in Washington, Carolyn Prasuti, VOA News. The UN Refugee Agency, UNHCR, marked World Refugee Day on Thursday with an appeal to nations to keep their doors open to many people fleeing conflict and persecution and abuse. Lisa Schlein reports for VOA from Geneva. A record 120 million people globally have been forcibly displaced. Most are displaced inside their home countries. 
but some 43 million are refugees who have fled across borders in search of international protection. The UN Refugee Agency reports around 30 million internally displaced people, refugees and asylum seekers live in Africa, representing almost one-third of the world's refugee population. UNHCR spokesperson Baba Baloch tells VOA three-quarters of the world's refugees live in countries with low or modest incomes. This, he says, debunks the myth that most refugees want to get to rich countries in Europe or to the United States. They don't. They are Sudanese refugees are in South Sudan. Baluch says Africa has shown unbounded generosity in welcoming people in crisis, despite the many conflicts, pockets of displacement, and widespread poverty on the continent. He says High Commissioner Filippo Grandi is observing World Refugee Day in South Sudan to remind people everywhere of the consequences of war. He is going there to be with the community, with already South Sudanese who have been displaced inside their countries, who now are welcoming refugees and other South Sudanese. The UNHCR says no one wants to be a refugee. No one becomes a refugee by choice. On this World Refugee Day, the agency is urging nations around the world to show solidarity with refugees, to welcome them into their communities and help them restart their lives. Lisa Schlein for VOA News, Geneva. One of the most difficult things for refugees after arriving in a new place is setting up a life there. That includes earning enough money to support themselves and their families. In Peshawar, Pakistan, former school teacher Zarghona Hamidi is teaching young Afghan refugee women like her how to make fashion jewelry so they can do just that. Musa Kasafi has the story narrated by Bezhan Hamdar. <laughs> Afghan refugee Zarhuna Hamidi is giving lessons in the art of making fashion jewelry from her house in the Pakistani city of Peshawar. It's been a month and a half since I started teaching 15 young women. I teach them how to make earrings, bracelets, necklaces, anklets and other things. Most of Hamidi's students are happy for the opportunity to earn money. Her student Fatima goes by her first name. She says they meet from 2 to 5 in the afternoon and have learned a lot. She wants to learn the art further. We come here from 2 to 5 p.m. and have learned a lot. I want to learn the art further to start making jewelry at home and help my husband. Hamidi says that Afghan refugees, particularly women, do not have many opportunities to work in Pakistan. Pakistan. Five years ago, she was a school teacher, but she lost that job as Pakistan imposed restrictions on Afghan refugees. She says that despite being a college graduate, she cannot find a job. I am educated and have a BA, but I can't find a job. When they look at my documents and CV, they say, you have the education. But when I show my card, they tell me, they can give me a job. The United Nations says that around 3.1 million Afghan refugees live in Pakistan, 800,000 of whom hold Afghan citizen cards. For Muska Safi in Peshawar, Pakistan, Bejan Hamdard, VOA News. International Edition continues. I'm Scott Walterman. Happy Hunger Games! And may the odds be ever in your favor. Donald Sutherland, one of Canada's most versatile and gifted actors who charmed and enthralled audiences in films like M.A.S.H. and Clute, Ordinary People, and The Hunger Games, has died at the age of 88. Sutherland began his career in the 1960s, going on to captivate audiences across several generations. Captain Hawkeye Pierce. That's from the movie MASH, about a medical unit in the Korean War. His big break came in 1967 when he joined the ensemble cast for the war film The Dirty Dozen. He found a totally new audience playing President Snow in The Hunger Games. I thought, this is a film that could change things. 
that could maybe motivate or activate or catalyze young people who have been, by and large, politely dormant. Sutherland received an Honorary Academy Award for Lifetime Achievement in 2017, though he was considered among the best actors to never receive an Academy Award nomination for any of his roles. Start roasting, and then this handle right here, you're going to push up and, and hold that there. The Coffee Center at the University of California's Davis campus is the first academic research facility dedicated to the study of coffee. Students roast and brew, sample, and scrutinize coffee as coursework toward chemical engineering degrees. I first started with the coffee kinetics project, so we did stuff about um, the roast of the coffee beans, so we took samples every minute. We tested the water activity um, throughout the roast. The 7,000-foot facility was officially opened recently after a $6 million renovation. I'm proud that this is the nation's first academic facility dedicated to coffee. And so for many years, coffee has been understudied. Given how important coffee is to our culture, to our economy, to our society, Coffee needs academic study. It needs an academic talent pipeline. We want to help elevate the world of coffee. Professors of food science, plant science, business, law, religious studies, and sociology lend their expertise to ongoing work at the center. This has been International Edition on The Voice of America. On behalf of everyone here at VOA, thank you so much for being with us. For pictures, stories, videos, and more, follow VOA News on your favorite social media platform through our apps from Apple and Google and online at voanews.com. In Washington, I'm Scott Walterman. Next, an editorial reflecting the views of the United States government. One of the nastier crimes that accompanies armed conflict is sexual violence, used as both spoils of war and to humiliate and terrorize the enemy. Sexual violence has been a tactic of war since ancient times, said Vice President Kamala Harris. Throughout history, those who have waged war have specifically targeted and violated women and girls to exert dominance and power over their bodies and to humiliate and terrorize and subdue entire populations. And sexual violence remains a gruesome part of modern conflict around the globe, she said. In Ukraine, Russian forces have raped women in occupied territories. In Iraq, when ISIS seized territory a decade ago, they forced women and girls into sexual slavery as they massacred thousands. In Sudan, the ongoing conflict includes paramilitary forces terrorizing women and girls through sexual violence. In Haiti, gangs have used sexual assault to rape and coerce communities into submission. And we've seen similar horrors in South Sudan, in Ethiopia, Central African Republic, and the DRC. And October 7, last year, Hamas committed horrific acts of sexual violence. In recent years, the international community has made great progress on recognizing that it is an attack on peace, stability, and human rights, said Vice President Harris. The United States has been proud to lead the way at the United Nations and around the world by providing rape kits and health care for survivors, training militaries and peacekeepers, she said. But that is not enough, because globally our system of accountability remains inadequate. Conflict-related sexual violence must be condemned unequivocally wherever and whenever it occurs. And we must fortify systems to prioritize action, systems that support survivors, effectively collect evidence, and promote investigation. It's one of the reasons why the Biden administration on June 17th launched the Dignity in Documentation Initiative, a program that will, among others, support UN efforts to end conflict-related sexual violence. For far too long, systems, whether they be law enforcement or judicial, have not sufficiently addressed conflict-related sexual violence. And for far too long, the consequences then stopped at mere condemnation rather than going to accountability. 
The bottom line is the use of sexual violence as a tactic of war is unconscionable, said Vice President Harris, and any failure to hold perpetrators accountable is a failure to live up to, by all of us, our common humanity. That was an editorial reflecting the views of the United States government. 